Today I'm heading out and talking to Michael King from iPoll Rank at his New York City office near Rockefeller Center. And then I'm gonna head over to IBM's New York City office and speak to Ted New about their SEO strategy at IBM. Looking forward to it, it's an awesome day. It's really nice and sunny outside as you can see over here. And it's gonna be a nice drive over to IBM and to iPoll Rank and I'm looking forward to talking to them about their SEO strategy. So stay tuned and hope you like it. Outside Michael King's office at iPoll Rank, I'm going inside to have a little chat with him about SEO. This is fairly new to me, mm -hmm. so hopefully this goes well. I'm better at typing than actually. Less, <laughs> you know, I'm not so good at typing anyway. So I just type a lot. Very fast. We now have that <laughs> it's on, on record. record. <laughs> I've said it many, many times. Anyway, thank you for having me here, Michael. Appreciate it. Can you tell us a little about yourself? I am Mike King, and first of all, thank you for having me on the vlog. Um, I'm Mike King. I run an agency called iPool Rank. We primarily do SEO and content strategy. We also do a lot of other things like machine learning work and so on. Um, you know, we're really focused on doing awesome work that we're proud of for our clients. You've been in the SEO space for a pretty long time. How many years has it been? I've been doing SEO since August of 2006, so it'll be 13 years next month. What was a major milestone in 2006? What happened then? That was pre-Panda. That was like pre-Florida. No, Florida I think was 2003. Was it? Oh, yeah. I'm old. So yeah, I definitely wasn't doing it in 03. And in fact, it wasn't like a continuous time span for me starting in 06, because I would just get jobs until my boss would piss me off and then I would go back <laughs> on tour. It was pretty off and on for a while until I really stuck with it after I went to Razorfish. And you've been in mo pretty much mostly agencies. Yeah, I've only been in-house in my SEO career once, like prior to all that, um, I was a computer science student and so I had a bunch of internships at like Microsoft and some startups and things like that, just building software um, and testing software. But as far as SEO, I've only been in-house once. How do you like running your own agency? Obviously now you have iPoll rank mm -hmm. uh, versus working for let's say Razorfish or other companies. I like it a lot more just because, you know, I have more control over what it is that we do and what clients we take on and things like that. And I also get the opportunity to create an environment that I would have worked in or wanted to work in rather, because you know, there was, there was always something that was just like wrong to me at every other agency that I worked at. Um, not to say that they were all bad places, um, but it was just something that was fundamentally wrong by how they were ran or what we did. And so I have the opportunity with iPool Rank to do a better job at the things that I thought were wrong. That's awesome. And you have a nice little agency here. Can yeah, talk a little about it? We've got 12 people. Um, they're not all physically here today. Like we can see them. You guys can't see them on camera world. And yeah, so we're oriented in like a pod structure, you know, a pod for us as an account manager, SEO person, content strategist, and an analyst. And then we've got developers and designers that live outside of that. And that really allows us to do work that, like I said, we're proud of. Like that's our value set. Proud is proactive, reliable, outstanding, useful, and dedicated. We just do stuff that we're excited about. We do a lot of content work. Um, we do a lot of technical SEO. We do a lot of like sitting around and being like, okay, what's next that we can capitalize on? What is it that we can do to be even more effective? So it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. One of your things that you're pretty well known for in the SEO community mm -hmm. is your speaking and how outgoing you are and kind of your personality. You have one of the biggest personalities in the SEO space. I'm not actually all that outgoing. I'm pretty much an introvert. It's, it's very much a night and day. Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, my girl calls it stage mic. You know, it's funny, uh, but yeah, I, I have a background of being a musician, and you know, I really hone that skill set by doing shows. So it's really natural for me to speak on um, stage because it's like you know, I'm used to controlling a crowd. I'm used to um, really engaging with a lot of people effectively. But the one-on-one -on -one part is a little harder for me. I get that. <laughs> a lot of people actually say that's I'm kind of the same way. Mm -hmm. I like if. I'm in a group of people and people are talking, I'll be in the corner. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but when you're on stage, obviously you have to perform. Sure. But I mean, your performance is like you you rap on stage sometimes, right? <laughs> Yeah, I've done that once or twice. <laughs> From this object, sexual stars, I can guess in my mind. I'm open to freaking fedora to the left of my eye. Passing it back, spitting all the back of the reps. I'm blasting these cats. Give me something, catch it back. So if you, that, you have any skill tips set. for people out there? Like, should they learn rapping? Or? <laughs> nah, it's, it's not even about that. I think for me, it's all about comfort, right? So, you know, if you get on stage and you're uncomfortable, that's going to come across. Um, so I always tell people like, wear your lucky shoes, you know, wear your favorite outfit, like do whatever it takes to make you comfortable on stage and then figure out what it is that makes you stand out. You know, like for me, it is the fact that I rhyme. And so, you know, my early presentations, I would work that in. So it was just like a way to make me stand out a little more. I don't do that as much anymore because it kind of becomes cliche if you keep doing things like that. But really figure out what it is that make you stand out. And, you know, if you are actually good at this, and you can perform, it's gonna go a long way. Awesome, it seems like you have a great time, so I appreciate all your work yeah. in terms of the community, it's amazing. Thank you. Let's talk a little about SEO specifically. Uh -huh. um, so content marketing, link building, mm -hmm. I think you would agree maybe, you could disagree with me, has link building changed a lot over the years? It has, but it hasn't. I think the way we talk about it has evolved pretty dramatically, and I think that with Penguin, everybody started to try to become effectively an ad agency, where like, yeah, we're gonna do all this big content and so on and so forth. But I think at the end of the day, the mechanics of link building are the same. Like you're still doing outreach to people, you're still doing your prospecting. And link building is actually a lot like sales right. in that you're like, okay, who can we reach out to? Who can we convince to place a link on something? And it obviously makes it more difficult when you can't pay somebody, right? right. So I say, I'd say what has changed is like, there's a lot less people that are overtly buying links than there were before. But as far as like how we do it, I mean, it's, it's the same as it ever was. There's like the high level side where you're reaching out to like journalists and things and you're trying to get coverage on TechCrunch and BuzzFeed and all that. And then you've got the lower level where it's like, yeah, we're building links on resource pages. Like that has not changed at all. I will say that the tool sets that we have these days are far better. I remember back in day in, in 2006 when we would do link building, it was literally whatever the target keyword is and then type in add URL and then you just like place links on comments, sites and so on and so forth. And that was mostly it, unless you were buying links. Um, so now, you know, the, the technology is just way better. Like tools like Pitchbox and, and Buzzstream and all the other ones that are similar to them allow you to really scale these approaches and even get more personal than people did before. So I would say that the mechanics are the same, the tools are better. And we have this like layer of being like, yeah, content, content, content. But at the end of the day, we're still doing the same stuff. Right, there's some difficult clients out there. Absolutely. So when you have a client that says, you know, here's my website, this is the content we have, we're not adding any more content, I don't care what you say. We don't take those on. You won't do it. No, so if you don't have awesome content already and you're not open to creating content, we don't want that link building engagement because effectively all you're doing is spamming the internet. Right. And that's not that's not what I signed up for. You know, I didn't, I didn't decide to start an agency just so I can spam the internet. Like I wanna, create things that people actually want and then help get those things out there to like drive more um, So when you're authority. meeting with a client, mm -hmm. you obviously have to understand their business. Mm -hmm. You take a look at what they currently have on their website mm -hmm. and you're like, all right, what are you, the client, doing differently that we could go ahead and kind of bring out on through the content on your website? That's Absolutely. What, that's the approach? Absolutely. So, you know, more operationally, we start with like a content audit, reviewing everything to see like what can be repurposed. You know, if you got white papers and things, how do we turn those into infographics and data visualization, things like that. And then figuring out where the gaps are. So we don't wanna just be creating content to make content. We wanna make sure that we're filling the user journey in spaces where they don't have stuff already. And then we build a content plan to say like, here's what we're gonna create, here are the workflows and governance models. So all the key people are reviewing things and so on and so forth. And then we launch some new stuff. And then on the back of that, that's when we start, you know, um, yeah, doing that promotion and such. And so we'll do that outreach earlier than when the thing is actually created. Like when, when the thing is like, let's say we're in the wireframe stage, we'll reach out to a bunch of people we think would be interested and say like, Hey, you have any feedback on this? And if they have feedback, then that gets some buy-in pretty much right away. And then once it launches, we'll say like, Hey, remember that thing we talked to you about? Can you link to it? So if we get enough interest early on, then we'll continue with that content piece 
But if we don't, then we'll just be like, oh, this one isn't gonna work. Has the name link building come tarnished? Like, do you call it content marketing? Do you try to avoid the word link building? Or do you not? I don't say link building. We more say link acquisition, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's the same thing, right? right? Like, and we'll say link acquisition through content or something like that. Um, to your point, I do believe link building is pretty tarnished. And in fact, we have a section on our site that says what we don't do. And one of the things is large scale link building. We will only do link building under very specific circumstances. We'll be like, we want an email address from the client. We want to uh, either have awesome content or create it. You know, we're just very specific because we don't want to set ourselves up for failure and we want to do things again that we're proud of. On that link building topic, for me, when Google introduced this no follow attribute, I think it was in 2005, 2004, mm -hmm. sometime around then, um, that kind of bugged me. It's because they're like saying, all right, now you need to tell us which links are not in accordance with their guidelines. Yeah. It used to be Google would figure it out. Sure. Um, so that me was one of the biggest things that kind of bothered me when Google changed their guidelines. Mm -hmm. Over the course of your you know, dozen or so years in the SEO space, is there any specific thing that you go back to and say, I wish Google never changed this or this guideline is really confusing people or it's hurting the overall ecosystem of the internet? I think the thing is that Google drives so much traffic that they've effectively become like the internet police, right? right. And so I think generally speaking, any of those guidelines kind of piss me off. <laughs> um, you know, because it's like, you, you can't tell us how we can act on the internet. But the thing is, it's their website. So they can say, you know, how things will be shown on their website. So I don't think I have a specific one. I mean, I think I'm more, I'm still more mad about not provided than I am any, yes. any guideline. That's true. Good. All right. Awesome. Well, how can people learn more about you or your company? I pour ink on Twitter, I pour ink.com, the website. Speaking yeah, anywhere soon? There. Uh, I'm actually about to have another baby, so I'm, I'm oh, not wow. going to be speaking for a while. Awesome. Yeah, so we're, we're going to do more webinars and things like that that I can do from home. Um, but yeah, 2020, I'll probably speak some more. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. So there you have it. From Michael King from iPoll Rank, how content marketing, link development, link building has changed over the years, or how has it changed over the years?